Timnocerans and Nopterans. Why do we need more of these? Monster Hunter only has a handful of them, and while we did receive a new addition to the cast in Rise with Raknakadaki, I'd like to go back to the original two, Nursilla and Celtus Queen. If we exclude minions and subspecies, they are a grand total of two Temnocerans in the series, Nursilla and Raknakadaki, that originate from the 4th and 5th generation respectively. Neopterons were introduced as early as the first generation of Monster Hunter, with Hornetors and Vespoids, and got expanded in later games to a few more species, such as Altaroths or Conchus. For larger monsters though, they only made a debut in the 4th generation, well, if you forget Vespoid Queen that is. To this day, this class did not get explored again in modern games, and it is a real shame when you look at their recent representatives. Celta's Queen is a giant hulking beetle equipped with a heavy carapace and a long scissor-like tail. She is definitely meant to be large and intimidating. You can see all of her weight in every step that she takes. Her mate, Celtus, will stay by her side and protect her through the entire fight. Even though Monster Hunter combat system is more adapted to 1v1 due to the target camera, the presence of two monsters around you still works fairly well here, since all of their moves have audio cues and their movesets were made to complement each other. It is also one of the few instances where two monsters face you at the same time as a couple, similarly to Raytheon and Raphalos, for example. Lunastra and Teostra do have a shared Nova, but our Celtus couple has many special features that separates it from the others, as we will see in a second. Celtus Queen is very slow by herself. She will unleash powerful tackles where her entire body swings at you. If she's threatened, Celtus Queen will cast noxious pheromones to call her mate. When the two combine Japanese mecha style, they become a literal tank. Their abilities synergize beautifully together with Celtus trying to drain your stamina with his mucus to prevent you from blocking or running away. Until you knock him off, Celtas will remain on her back, shooting projectiles at range and slashing with his claws if you get up close. Despite being smaller than her, he is also able to lift her in the air to either slam the ground or charge at you across the arena. He will even take her out of pitfall traps and keep fighting back if she's paralyzed by a shock trap. Celtas Queen is much faster and aggressive in this state, as if nothing could stand in her path now. She will release highly pressurized blasts of water with high recoil, but she fires off like a cannon. Hell, even her subspecies can even use her own mate as ammunition, tearing him to pieces in the process. If that happens, Celtas Queen will call another one, as many times as she pleases. She will outright kill the male whenever she's starving to feed off his carcass. Good job, Celtus. You are about as good as Ibushi on that one. If it wasn't obvious enough in her combat encounter, the equipment made from Celtus Queen reflects her inspiration from Japanese mechas, with many mechanical parts of very futuristic design. Her armor skills completely align with her character, by boosting artillery power and raising guard levels. The description even quotes a valiant hero jumping at the face of danger, and many of her weapons are blessed with a drill that should pierce the heavens. A new skill present on her set in Generations Ultimate, called Hero Shield, negates damage received from minor enemy attacks, which is yet another fun little nod to those references. As we all know, Monster Hunter 4 brought a lot more verticality in the series, not only in terms of gameplay, with the addition of aerial attacks or the brand new mounting mechanic, but also in the world itself, with an abundance of cliffs, ledges and uneven terrain. Several monsters were designed in that regard, and Nursilla was one of them. She will cling upside down on flat surfaces like vines and spider webs to attack the player from any angle by firing sticky webs. Should you fall in her traps, she will sling you to her and strike you with her stinger. For her physical appearance, the developers were concerned about not making her too much out of place in a game where wyverns and beasts were the most common enemies encountered by the player. Many ideas were put on the table, such as having her throw her webs like a lasso to catch prey, or the ability to weave bioluminescent silk, but these were not implemented eventually, perhaps in future games. Instead, Nursella is known for wearing the skin of her victims, which will give her new properties. 
If she feeds on Gypsy Rose, she will absorb their venom and protect herself with a thunderproof mantle that, in return, will make her vulnerable to fire. If she feeds on Kedzu's, she will not only do the world a favor, but also gain paralyzing neurotoxins. The crystal spikes on her back result from the solidification of his venom when she's resting upside down. You can even see it dripping when she's hanging above you. Just like Celta's queen, Nursila has four walking legs and two appendages on her mouth that, instead of being used for digging and shielding her from attacks, have evolved into extremely sharp chelicery to rip her enemies apart. But Nursila has another set of deadly weaponry. She can fully extend her jaws outside of her mouth and snap them shut instantly when she ambushes you from below to clasp her giant rows of teeth and you barely make it out in time. There is a thrilling sense of being chased by a ruthless predator in its own turf. She's very agile too, capable of jumping in the air, circling around you, or propelling herself at high speed with strands of silk. To balance out her fast mobility, it is worth noting that she tends to stagger quite easily, and it's just as satisfying as always. Her subspecies trades the tropical climates of forests and caves for the cold, sandy nights of the desert, where she lurks on her prey from beneath the ground and swings on her threads with complete mastery to quickly traverse this vast wasteland. Her color palette is beautifully crafted in both cases. The original bears a white, silvery body covered in a darker coat of skin, like some sort of grim reaper. The bright orange sections of her extremities pair nicely with the purple spikes to signify the danger of her toxic nature. Colors are essentially swapped on the subspecies, called Shrouded Nursula, with a deep blue exoskeleton and a pale cloak pierced by her yellow venomous spikes, a scheme reminiscent of Triconephila clavata, a species of spider that can be found in Japan. Nursilla weapons and armor have a rather alien design, with solid sharpness, high affinity, and an emphasis on status elements and capture skills. The aesthetic of her set has a lot of finesse and elegance to it, with the same drapes as Nursilla herself. The most remarkable trait of Nursilla and Celtus Queen is that they're not only unique visually, they move and behave unlike any other monster, one with her body twitching in a rather unsettling way, or the unflinching confidence of a second making the ground quake as she walks. The animations, the sounds, Everything that they do transpires what you would expect from a creepy crawling creature or an absolute mass of unshakable will, and I love it. Aside from the number of legs, both Nursilla and Celta's Queen fit the monster hunter niche for spiders and insects. It is honestly spectacular how much life was implemented to give these monsters their own identity. With the amount of flying wyverns, fanged wyverns, or elder dragons present in the franchise, there are many subclasses of monsters that definitely deserve more recognition. These two have tons of personality, and I can only hope that we will see more of them in the future. Maybe someday. For now, I wish you a lovely day and happy hunting. Peace.